in color from Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, it's the 1969 World Series as the New York Mets versus the Baltimore Orioles for game number two. Now, here are today's commentators, Kurt Gowdy and Tony Kubek. Another beautiful sun-bathed afternoon here in Baltimore. Temperature in the 70s, just a slight breeze, and a perfect day for baseball again. I'm Kurt Gowdy. This is Bill O'Donnell, a broadcaster of the Baltimore Orioles. And down in the stands, the room to bring you highlights, and special guest will be Tony Kubek. Well, Baltimore did it yesterday with a combination that carried it to an easy American League championship. Strong pitching, sharp defensive plays when they had to have it, and timely hitting. The Mets, of course, hope to split now in the uh, enemy ballpark and then go home with three games starting in New York on Tuesday at Shea Stadium. We have two left-handers pitching today. One of the bright young stars of the New York Mets, Jerry Kuzman, is going to be going. And Jerry, of course, won 17 games this year. He uh, missed nearly a month and still won those 17. He had the fifth lowest earned run average in the National League. Jerry Kuzman is going for the New York Mets. A left-hander is going for the Baltimore Orioles. That's Dave McNally. Kuzman is 25. McNally is 26. McNally won his first 15 games of the year against no losses. Then went on to post a record of 20 wins and seven losses. The last time he pitched in a World Series, he shut out the Dodgers one to nothing. And just a week ago today, he shut out the Minnesota Twins in 11 innings, winning one to nothing, giving up just three hits. Those are the pitches. The weather's great. And now to tell you more about the game, here's Bill O'Donnell. Thank you, Kurt. I think uh, Mets fans, and I'm sure the Mets ball players, can take a little bit of heart uh, from a World Series standpoint if they just look back to what happened a year ago. The home club a year ago, namely the Cardinals, won the first ball game. Then the Tigers came back, and they won the second ball game behind Lowly. Additionally, uh, the Mets can take heart from how Fever and the relievers handled the power of the Orioles here yesterday, namely Blair, Frank Robinson, Powell, and Brooks Robinson, uh, limiting those four power boys to only one day's hit in 15 times at that. As far as uh, our ballpark here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore is concerned, you remember that yesterday we commented that although it is only 309 feet down both the left and the right field foul line, this indeed is a tough park in which to pull. Yesterday, uh, convincingly, there were really only two balls that pulled with conviction. The home run by Buford down the right field side and the sacrifice line drive to left field by Weiss in the seventh inning, which produced the only net run. Uh, yesterday, really pitching predominated more than did the hitting. Well, Tony Kubek has the guest downstairs, and let's go down to Tony right now. Thank you, Bill. We're standing here in the commissioner's box with Commissioner Bowie Kuhn, and right to my right, Joe DiMaggio, a name that I think everybody remembers. And Joe, this has been quite a year for you. Named on the all-time great team, it's been some summer. Well, it certainly has, and thanks so much, uh, Tony. The thing is, I wish we had been in the World Series. But here I am attending it and I'm enjoying it. Joe, you, uh, of course, viewed this Baltimore Orioles ball club all year long in your capacity as a vice president with the Oakland A's. What about, what are your impressions of this ball club? Well, they're an assured ball club. I have never seen a more confident one. I have seen them all year. The thing that impresses me more than anything else is the fact that they will make a physical mistake every so often. But no mistakes they do not make. They know just when to run. They know uh, when to make the cutoff plays. They do it all very well. They're pitching we know without a doubt it's very fun. What about uh, this Mets ball club? Have you seen much of them this year? Well, I haven't seen too much of them. I saw some of the playoff games, and I'd have to say that the Gil Hodges has done just a fabulous job in getting this young team together. The most outstanding thing that they have in their ball club naturally is their pitchers. But you have to give that catching a little credit, too. And there again, I'd have to say that Yogi Bear has done a fine job in working with some of these boys, as well as that coaching center. Joe, you know, talking about center field for just a little bit, I, something I noticed, of course, you were a great center fielder. You played fairly shallow throughout your career in Yankee Stadium. You had a lot of room to room. Have you had a chance to uh, see Paul Blair? He well, plays very shallow. Have. I certainly have. As a matter of fact, I commented on that just the other day with McNamara and some of the American League officials in that box. 
And I said, that man plays an awful callous center field. But we'll blow it up there while a line drive turn, he can go over his head. And at that time, it was a critical point to assume it on base. He does play an awful shallow center field. Now, right, let's talk a little bit about the third basis for this Baltimore ball club. You've seen some great third basemen and played with some, too. What about Brooks Robinson? What about the play he made yesterday? One of the finest, I think, that I have seen in all my baseball years. I didn't get to see Robinson too much up until the time that I went to spring training with the Yankees. And I saw a lot of Boyer. And I think that Boyer was about as fine a third baseman I've ever seen. But this man has to be his equal, if not, possibly a little better. Like that one play he made coming in and all in one motion and thrown from any position and getting that boy at first base, he did a great job. And I think everything he does around third base is just great. Joe, let me ask the commissioner of baseball a question. Commissioner, we saw another fine ball game again yesterday, but I think you'll agree it's not over with yet. These Mets fans can't wait to get up to New York City. Well, the Mets have been climbing for the last eight years, Tony. They're used to looking up, so I don't think the Mets are giving up at all. I think we're going to have quite a series from here on in. Well, with that... The playoff against the Braves. Every time Henry entered and hit a home run, Garrett came along and hit one, then Boswell came along. They're a club that just doesn't give up. Well, this team has shown a great deal of bounce back, the Mets ball club, and I, I think you'll see it again. Commissioner Bowie Kuhn, Joe D., thank you so much. Now let's go on back upstairs. And now we're going to meet the starting lineup and the individual members of the Baltimore Orioles and the New York Mets. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Memorial Stadium for the second game of the 1969 World Series. Here are the official lineups. First, the New York Mets. Here is the manager of the New York Mets, number 14, Gil Hodges. Batting first and playing center field, number 20, Tommy Agee. Batting second and playing shortstop, number three, Bud Harrelson. Batting third and playing left field, number 21, Cleon Jones. Batting fourth and playing first base, number 22, Don Glendennis. Batting fifth and playing right field, number four, Ron Swoboda. Batting sixth and playing third base, number five, Ed Charles. Batting seven and catching for New York, number 15, Jerry Grote. Batting eight and playing second base, number six, Al White. Batting ninth and pitching for the match this afternoon, number 36, Jerry Kuzman, who is warming up on the sidelines. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the New York Mets. Now, for the Baltimore Orioles, here is the manager of the Orioles, number four, Batting first and playing left field, number nine, Don Buford. Batting second and playing center field, number six, Paul Blair. Batting third, playing right field, number 20, Frank Robinson. Batting fourth, playing first base, number 26, Boog Powell. Batting fifth, playing third base, number five, Brooks Robinson. Batting 
Batting six, playing second base, number 15, Dave Johnson. Batting seven, catching for Baltimore, number eight, Andy Echevarri. Batting eight, the shortstop, number seven, Mark Salinger. Batting ninth, and pitching for the Orioles this afternoon, number 19, Dave McNally, who is warming up on the sideline. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the Baltimore Orioles. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and join in the singing of our national anthem, which will be played by the York Suburban High School Band. The star flag you saw is a replica of the original flag that flew over Fort McHenry in 1814. And the second game of the 1969 World Series being brought to you from Baltimore as the New York Mets meets the Baltimore Orioles. Before station identification, this is... Tossed out the first ball, or maybe she's going to do it again. The widow of the man voted the greatest player of all time in baseball, Babe Ruth, was born here in Baltimore, Maryland. And now she repeats the toss to Andy Etcheberry, the Baltimore catcher. Mrs. Ruth was flanked by Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams, two members of the all-time living outfield. Willie Mays is the other. Ruth was voted the greatest player of all time. The Orioles are breaking on the field, getting a roar from the hometown fans. And we're just about ready to go now for game two, and here to set up the Baltimore defense and take you into the opening four and a half innings of play-by-play, -play, Bill O'Donnell. Thank you, Kurt, and hello again, everybody. It'll be Boo Powell playing at first base this afternoon for the Orioles. And at second base, chatting with the second base umpire, that is Dave Johnson. At shortstop, man with a very good glove, like Harrelson of the Mets, this is Mark Belanger. And the man with a vacuum glove at third base, Brooks Robinson, who had the play of the ball game defensively yesterday. Out in left field, this is Don Buford. 
In center field, the man of whom Joe DiMaggio spoke so glowingly a couple of moments ago, Paul Blair. The right fielder is Frank Robinson. The catcher, who uh, was not behind the plate yesterday, this is Andy Echeverry. And the second game, Baltimore starter, young man from Billings, Montana. This is Dave McNally. He makes his year-round home right now in Baltimore. McNally, whom uh, Kurt commented about during his uh, pregame uh, conversation, won 15 ball games in a row before he suffered his first setback. Actually, he strung a streak of 17 victories in a row, going back to uh, his last two wins in 1968. And then McNally got beat by the Minnesota Twins to break that streak. This is Tommy Agee now to lead off for the Mets. Uh, the Orioles lead, one victory to none. These two clubs will go to New York uh, after this ball game. Tomorrow is considered the travel day, with game three on Tuesday. Now, it's game two, and McNally, first pitch of the afternoon. A curve and strike. In McNally's last appearance, that was in an American League Championship Series game, game two against the Twins, his fastball was actually even more effective than the breaking ball. One strike. Here's the fastball, one and one. On deck, uh, this is Bud Harrell. A.G. went after the outside fastball, a ball and two strikes. A.G. extremely aggressive, and he'll go for that outside pitch. Unusual for a leadoff batter like A.G. to have as many RBIs as he had this year. He drove over 76 runs batting from the top five. One and two. Foul tip past the throwing hand of Echeverry. The catcher at whom you're looking caught all four games uh, the last time the Orioles were in a World Series back in 1966. And he caught McNally in that series in games one and four. One and two again to A.G. Still alive on the foul, right back in front of our NBC booth. McNally will, uh, as you see him finger that ball, he'll place the ball right in the glove. And he'll get the ball in the glove exactly as he wants to grip it. One and two. No play on the foul ball, drifting back of the Mets dugout. I think the tip on McNally, Bill, that the fans should watch for, when he gets his curve over, that's when he's really tough. And when he ran into a slump in September, the Orioles said he went into the slump because he wasn't getting his curve where he wanted to. One, two, and no play on the hot shot foul outside the Orioles dugout. During the season, uh, the Mets manager, uh, Gil Hodges, pointed out, especially late in the season, uh, quite a few of his ballplayers who made the outstanding contribution, and A.G. was included in that list. Out number one, McNally hangs up his first strikeout. The umpires working today, Frank of the National League at the play. First base umpire from the American League, Larry Knox. Jack Crawford from the National League at second. The third base umpire, by the way, working his first World Series, Lou DeMuro of the American League. The foul line umpires, Lee Wire from the National League and Hank Storr from the American League. Strike one to the fouling, Buck Harrell. Where that Albert slip in? I've never, <laughs> real name, but I've never heard him called Albert. Harrelson went one for three in yesterday's opening game of the series, and those are his stats for the season. He sprays the ball, moves around, moves the ball around the outfield and the infield quite a bit. McNally will have to hurry his throw because Harrelson has speed. Just got to it. Harrelson was out by an eyelash at first base. McNally charged off the mound about two steps to the grass and towards the third base foul side. The Met coaches at the top of the screen, the third base boss is Eddie Yost. And there is a likable Yogi Berra, the boss of first base. There are two gone now on the top of the first inning. And here is Cleon Jones.
Jones went one for four yesterday against Quayle. Number 21, Jones. Jones, who finished uh, third among uh, the National League hitters during 1969, following uh, Pete Rose and Roberto Clemente. Jones added three for Two gone, we're just in the top of the first inning and just underway. Right long. This is called John Flanden in the New York first baseman. You'll notice that McNally will not whip the arms in his wind up over the head. He feels he has uh, he feels he has short arms and he'd rather wind to the side of his head rather than back on top. The fastball fouled away. It's Powell giving it a chase, but uh, it will drift in the seat. Jones uh, led the Mets in many departments. Uh, McNally led the Orioles in a few pitching departments, including games started. He actually started more ball games than Cuellar did during 1969. McNally ahead and two strikes. No play again on the foul ball upstairs. You see that spot at which uh, we're looking right now, and we just moved away from it. During a ball game this year when Sam McDowell was in here to pitch against the Indians, uh, as some ball players do understandably, he got a mad at uh, an umpire's call and he threw the ball two rows from the top of the upper deck. One ball, two strikes, Jones. That's how. Uh, some school students here in uh, Baltimore feel about their bird. They represent a school called Towson State College. One and two. Powell has a chance over by the box seat. And that retires the side, one, two, three. And so at the middle of the first inning, the score is the Mets nothing with the Orioles coming to bat. Here's the way the Mets now will set up defensively behind uh, left-hander Jerry Kuzman, Don Clendenin, the New York first baseman. At second base, the clever fielding Al White. And a young man with a lot of range at shortstop to the holder back of second. This is Bud Harrelson, the shortstop. Third baseman for Gil Hodges is Ed Charles. Out in left field is Cleon John. And a man with a lot of range both in and back is Tommy A.G. in center. And the right fielder, a Baltimore-bred youngster, by the way, Ron Svoboda. As he did yesterday, Jerry Grody will catch game two for the Mets. And appearing for the first time in a World Series, the young left-hander is Jerry Kuzman. Kuzman goes six feet two, 205 pounds. And this is how Kuzman fared during the Mets' uh, pennant-winning 1969 season. He won 17 overall, and he lost nine. Kuzman, uh, like McNally, leans on fastballs and good breaking stuff for his outfit. And the figuring before game time is that Kuzman perhaps has the better fastball than McNally, that perhaps McNally has the better breaking pitch than Kuzman. Kuzman's having trouble getting that mound to his lacking. He's been scraping on it and digging and pounding out there. Every pitcher has his own feeling of the pitching rubber and how comfortable he is on his step off. All right, Kurt, here is Don Buford who led off uh, yesterday's ball game on the second pitch with a home run. He bats from either side. Strike one. First, he swung left-handed yesterday to get that first inning home run. And he drove over two of the Orioles' four runs yesterday. The breaking ball, it's the ball on the strike. Kuzman, for the most part, uh, with his pitches, will come from right on top. Uh, against some left-handers, he'll go from the first base side. The let up, and it had the place, but a little bit high. Two balls and one strike. Kuzman missed uh, quite a bit of the early part of the season, but yet wound up making 32 starts nonetheless. Two and one. Two balls and two strikes. 
On deck, this is Paul Blair. Kuzman had uh, quite a record uh, down in the minors a couple of years ago before being called back up for good by the big club. Two and two. Got him on the fastball right into his hand. So uh, Kuzman, as well as McNally, both picked up strikeouts against leadoff batters. And these are Mets fans and their biggest fans. Their owner, Mrs. John Payson. Paul Blair, hitless in three trips yesterday, and 285 for the year. Like Frank Robinson, Blair will crowd the plate quite a bit. Yesterday, uh, Met pitchers uh, served Blair more breaking stuff than good live fastball. The changeup, Jones with plenty of room out in left field, and more room than even he needed. An easy play for the Mets and for Fleon Jones out in left in a quick second out. Two up and two away in the bottom of the first inning. The Orioles coach at the top of the screen is Billy Hunter, the coach is third. And the first base coach is George Dalton. This is part now of the Orioles power jazz. Frank Robinson, who ripped off 32 home runs, but was held hitless yesterday. All one. As a matter of fact, he was fanned twice yesterday. The Met pitching did a fine job against Blair, both Robinson and Powell, limiting that foursome to only one base hit. One and oh. Deep right center field. Very deep APN Svoboda. And Svoboda right in front of the 390 foot marker. That ball uh, right to the marker. And so at the end of the first inning of score is Baltimore nothing and New York nothing. Boda made a fine play just before Frank Robinson came to bat. The breeze sprung up and is blowing in from right center toward home plate. Held that ball up just a bit. Boda got a good jump on it over there in front of the right uh, center field area. To keep it from going out. Well, Prince, this game is authorized on the television rights granted by Major League Baseball solely for the entertainment of our audience. And any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the commissioner of baseball is prohibited. Don Clendenin starts the top of the second inning. Strike one to Clendenin, who had a pair of base hits yesterday, including a double in the left center field power alley with Ron Svoboda coming on next. After the fastball, and not too much room for Powell with it back in the seat. Clem Denon, uh, for his size, gets down in a pretty uh, deep crouch, and then when that ball comes forward, he tries to just uh, strike and streak right for it. One and two. Clem Denon, the only man this year on a visiting club to hit uh, two home runs at Dodger Stadium against L.A. Pitching. One, two. Two balls, two strikes, didn't get the fastball through. McNally made 40 starts during the regular season. He completed 11 of them. He had four shutouts, including a one-hitter against Minnesota. The curve missing. Three balls and two strikes. The American League leader in starts was Denny McLean of the Tigers. He made 41 starts. So two men on the spot. Clendenin leading off the top of the second. He loses him. Walk number one in the ball game. And Clendenin, the leadoff batter now, becomes from the Mets standpoint the go-ahead run at first base. Well, the Orioles have been in five World Series games, four in 1966, one yesterday. They've never lost a series ball game. Here is Ron Svoboda.
the vote yesterday against Cuellar was one for three. He had a base hit his last time up. Powell holds. Clendenin is leading. Didn't get the fastball into his letters. He jammed it to the inside corner. Now McNally has two kind of good breaking pitches, hard slider, and a pretty good curve. He did not actually lose the slider until last season. He came up with the slider as a new pitch a year ago. One ball, one strike. That's Frank Sicori of the National League doing uh, the ball strike calling back of Echebar. Voboda, who helped uh, the Mets and made a great contribution during their pennant drive in August and September, drove over a lot of runs. One and one. Should be playable by Powell. He's got a high sky in front of him also. And Powell with the glasses down against the high sky for the putout. The second game of the World Series today is being brought to you in living color on the World Series Network. And that's NBC. One gone in the next second inning, and here is third baseman Ed Charles. Charles was hitless yesterday in game one. A strike. The breaking stuff kind of fooled Charles as he yanked his head away. Frank Sicori, who just went out to check home plate, and now we're looking at the on deck batter, Jerry Grody. The Corey of has played in a World Series. That was back in 1945 for the Cubs. One strike. It's another one. McNally has been working tight to Charles. He gave him a low breaking pitch right into his knee. Now this is not a, a kind of a, it's not a muggy day, but it is a warm day. And the warmth already showing in the perspiration of McNally. Johnson will get the fourth play and there'll be no play to first base. Actually, Clendenin had to hold up. Clendenin could not move with conviction towards second base because Clendenin was not sure whether Johnson could actually get to the line drive before it hit the dirt. Johnson had a similar play yesterday in the eighth inning. Harrelson hit him a ball just like that. That low line drive getting one hopper. A tough chance. Charles is now the base runner with two away in the top of the second inning. And here's one of the scrappy ball players on this Mets 1969 National Championship Club, Jerry Grody, the catcher. Ball one, Jerry. Jerry had a base hit yesterday. As the Mets got six hits off Cuellar, and the Orioles also had six. Uh, off next to one oh to Grody. Fastball right down the middle. It cut the plate and fell hard. McNally, probably more than uh, any other Oriole pitcher, spends very little time concentrating on the runner. Normally, all he'll do is give him a quick look. McNally's main concern, he will tell you, is to concentrate to the plate. He had the notion, and the strike was called by Sikori. One and two. When McNally this year has had his biggest problem, has been early in ball games when he's had serious control difficulties. More often than not, McNally has been strong late and weak early. On the way to second is Charles, and pulled down by Johnson. Echebaron had some trouble. Echebaron had some trouble on the loose ball, and I think Weaver is complaining to Sikori that uh, Echebaron was impeded and blocked by Grody. I think Weaver is complaining that uh, Grody got in the way of Echebaron. I wonder if he's going to show us that little smile. So there he goes back to the dugout. He has sort of an angelic smile he gives the umpires. And it's become irritating around the league. That's just his manner. He's 
a rookie World Series manager, has done a great job with these Orioles. Never played in the major league. The wild pitch charged to McNally on the advance by Charles to second base. So for the first time early in the ball game, one club has the runner in scoring position. The count to Grody, two balls, two strikes, with two outs. Had a notion again, but then Brody just checked the swing and time on that breaking pitch into his hand. Brody batted 252, but in many clutch situations, as this is Charles with his lead at second base, in many clutch situations for the Mets, during their pennant express drive, Brody delivered key base wallet. Pay pick, 3 2 coming. And that bounced off the foot of Brody. And so that'll be a foul ball, and Grody will have to walk it off. There's no way that a sting like that on top of the foot wears off quickly. You just have to let the pain subside and just think about it and just chew down on the lip. But Grody being a catcher, and that probably is a... Uh, the one part of a ball club where you have to have your most scrappy type of ball player, a guy like Brody, recovers quickly. Still three and two, and that's Charles off second. Still alive, right back to the screen on the foul ball. We have left-handers uh, like McNally as starters today against Kuzman. It will be right-handers due to start Tuesday at Shea Stadium in New York. Palmer for Baltimore, Gentry for the New York Mets. Money pitch again. Belanger or Blair should get to it, and they're going to give it Blair coming in and facing it. Blair for the putout in shallow center field. And so at the middle of the second inning. The score is New York nothing, Baltimore nothing. Tony Kubek is ready downstairs with an interesting guest. Tony, whom do you have? Thank you. I've got Mrs. Babe Ruth down here. Mrs. Ruth, it was quite a thrill for you this year, I think, during the summer to receive those awards for the Babe, wasn't it? Well, it was the greatest honor I ever bestowed upon Babe. And really and truly, I was speechless. I was so happy, and he could only have been here to receive them, but... It was just great, Tony. Mrs. Ruth, you know, the babe, I guess, having spent his boyhood in Baltimore, had a real warm spot for this town, doesn't he? Yes, he always considered Baltimore his own, although he played most of his career in New York City. Baltimore was always nearest to his heart. Mrs. Babe Ruth, thank you so much. Nice to see you at the ballpark. Okay, Tony. Well, nice to see you again. Thank you very much. Now let's go on back upstairs. Thank you, Tony Kovac and the lovely Mrs. Babe Ruth. In the bottom of the second inning, the ball game is scoreless. And here's uh, the man they consider the babe in Baltimore. Powell with a big bat. That let up curve. Kuzman trying to keep Powell off balance. The Powell does have a tendency to lunge a bit. Pull the breaking uh, stuff right into the seats, and that's fairly deep down the right field side. Kuzman way ahead of Powell at 0-2. We commented about Blair, Frank Robinson, Powell, and Brooks Robinson being held by Seaver and company to only one hit yesterday. This is Brooks Robinson on deck. Powell was the one who had the base hit. He tried to go crossfire from the first base side, Kurt. I was talking to Powell today and asked him how he hit left-handers, and he said uh, he had a seasonal average of 303 against left-handers this year. He's very proud of that. One, two, deliver. He went with that hard stuff again from the first base side. Second year that uh, this gentleman played organized baseball with uh, the club of the New York Penn League, Auburn, he had an under an average of a, under a run and a half a game, and he fanned Powell on let up breaking stuff for his second strikeout. Two strikeouts hung up by Kuzman. With Brooks Robinson uh, now coming to the plate, we'd like to remind you that tomorrow night, 
Bob Hope plays host to Mr. Jimmy Durante, Tom Jones, Barbara McNair, and Donald O'Connor as Chrysler presents the Bob Hope Special. That's tomorrow night at 9, 8 o'clock Central Time, right here on NBC. Brooks Robinson, who made the play of the ball game defensively yesterday on pinch hitter Rob Gaspar's tapper on the grass. Ball one to Brooks. Dave Johnson will be batting there. One zero, two balls, no strikes. The outfield right now is playing Brooks uh, almost as deep in right as it's playing Brooks in left. Age is giving it the long run, plus Harrelson retreating. It is Harrelson, the shortstop, back in shallow center field. Kuzman has faced five, has retired five in a row. And now here is Dave Johnson. Kurt, before the ball game today, chatting with Johnson in the clubhouse, we asked him if he was uh, more relaxed going into the 69 series than he was going into the 66. And surprisingly enough, he said, I'm actually more nervous in this one than I was in my first one. I'm still saying a little knowledge is better. <laughs> one strike to Johnson now with two guys. Andy Echebarren is on there. And the Oriole bat boy right beside him, James is on. Soft curve for a ball on the strike. Kuzman looks good, Bill. He's got that hard fastball, but that curve he's using for a changeup has been very effective. One thing about him, Kurt, he doesn't waste any time. Give me the ball, let me throw it. Two balls and one strike. He explains that. He says, what else is there to do between pitch and pitch? Two gone, bottom of the second inning. No score. Foul about five to ten feet off that left field foul side. Down the left field line, you will notice, as you look back to that 14-foot high fence, there's actually only one short stride between the foul line right there and that restraining fence. So anything hit down that line is very difficult to play. Kuzman, three and two with Dave Johnson. Still three and two. At the moment, and we're very early in the ball game, at the moment, Kuzman seems far more in control of his pitches than Seaver did uh, at the same point of the ball game yesterday. Kuzman had retired five in a row, and he, like McNally, now have both given up a walk. McNally passed uh, the leadoff batter in the top of the second inning, Charles. And now Kuzman free tickets Johnson with two out in the bottom of the second inning. Barry Seven, Barry Seven, Barry Seven. Barry Seven. Barry Seven. Mike Powell batted uh, very good against left-handers. Uh, Echebarren and Hendrick were platooned all season long back of the plate. Agee's got a tough play, but he made uh, a good run for it, galloping to deep center field. Agee played it perfectly, timed it perfectly. And so at the end of the second inning, the score is New York nothing, Baltimore nothing. Well, some 50,000 here at Memorial Stadium today, and among them are Tony Kubek and the chairman of the board of the Baltimore Baseball Club, Jerry Hofberger. Tony? Thank you, Bill. Mr. Hofberger, your ball club had some kind of year. Yeah, it sure did have some kind of year. We're just pleased to be here and hope we can get through a few more ball games and win at least four, then we really have some kind of year. I guess you're taking your crew up to New York to see the series up I'm there. I'm taking everybody who wants to go. Everybody. Hofberger, thank you so much. Congratulations once again. Let's go back upstairs. All right, thank you, Tony. And Mr. Jerry Hofberger, Al Weiss has looked at strike one. He'll be followed by Kuzman and A.G. here in the top of the third. McNally and Kuzman hooked up in a scoreless pitching duel. Fastball, he kept it outside. The Weiss and fit the corner with it. Kuzman with a windbreaker is on deck. Two strikes to Weiss.
one and two. Weiss drove in the only net run yesterday with a sacrifice fly to left field. Weiss has not played in this park uh, since he was involved in the 1967 collision at second base with Frank Robinson. Well, about 20,000 umpires were in behind Frank Sikori. Two balls and two strikes. The fastball, he got it for a base hit right down the pipe and belt high. Weiss got his kind of pitch and has drilled it for a base knock. That is the ball game, first base hit. So in the third, like the second, the Mets have the leadoff batter aboard. Charles drew a walk but was left. Uh, actually, he was I'm not right. left stranded, but I'm eventually right. uh, Charles was I'm left stranded. Right. Right. Here's Jerry Kuzman. He throws left, but that's from the other side. He had four base hits with the bat uh, during the regular season. Weiss at first, nobody out. Robinson creeping up from third. Strike one to Kuzman. Kuzman taking a glance to Eddie Yost to find out whether the sacrifice uh, bunt sign has still been flagged. Brooks still creeping up, getting all he can. It looked like Kuzman wanted to bunt the ball towards the uh, first baseman, Boog Powell. Now, some fellows uh, are instructed, pitchers included. Some are instructed by managers or coaches try to bunt to certain fellows and keep bunts away from other fields. And it looked like Kuzman was trying to lay it down towards Powell rather than Robinson. Over there on the left side of your picture, uh, Robinson still staying tight to the grass and keeps on moving in. They expect the bunt. And it was foul tipped off the throwing hand of Andy Etchebarren. Or no, it was missed off uh, Etchebarren, but with a runner occupying first base, the ball obviously then was not touched. Or if it was touched on the second strike and it was fouled off, that's the reason Kuzman has gone back to the dugout. That's the Oriole trainer, Ralph Salvon, with manager Earl Weaver finding out just how much of the foul tip on the second strike bothered at you there. Here it is. You ever see a catcher, the old catcher's hands? That's uh, ticked off the bat. Number 20. Well, they take a beat behind that plate with that bare hand. One away now as uh, Kuzman tried to bunt on the second strike, fouled it off, and that will be a McNally strikeout. That will be his second strikeout. One away, top of the order, and here is A.G. Tommy A.G. struck out in the first inning. Strike one. A.G. is 0 for 5 in the series, and this is Harold Fernandez. Breaking ball, and uh, McNally just let up a bit on that breaking shot. Bill, in nine of the first ten batters that McNally's face, he's had one strike on him. He's had that first pitch in there for a strike. Powell holding and White leading. Tough chance for two. And they just managed to get one because of the good range of Belanger. Belanger had to go deep to the hole. Watch Belanger's range on this. He's a brilliant fielding shortstop. He's a great basketball star at Pittsfield, Massachusetts High School. Look at his agility. He gets that throw away with something on it right on target. Belanger can range right, left. And he and Brooks Robinson really make it hard to drive the ball through that left side of the infield. Two away now in the Mets third inning. The runner at first base is A.G., who just grounded into that fourth play with Belanger starting the great throw from the hold on the left side. This is Bud Harrell from the shortstop. Ball one.
Harrelson, uh, neither big nor strong nor heavy. He doesn't go more than 150 pounds. That's one of the few times that McNally, during a ball game, goes to first base, as we mentioned. He's made his first move in the ball game to first base. Now, A.G. likes to run. He's aggressive with the bat, and he's also aggressive on, on the bases. Two and oh to Harold. Harrelson picked up uh, quite a few base hits uh, this year, using the bat to bunt and also likes to drag bunt. Fastball was too tight, three and zero. Oh. McNally right now is having his uh, very first struggle situation of the ball game. And Echebarren uh, going out for one of two purposes, telling McNally that perhaps he's releasing the ball at the wrong spot. Or telling him maybe that he'd like to throw Harrelson a different way. Harrelson, by the way, when he was in high school, was actually a third baseman. And when he got in the minors, he was changed over to a shortstop. Three and oh. Four pitchers, and he loses him. McNally has now given up two walks. The biggest threat in the ball game by either side now being provided here in the top of the third. Harrelson at first, A.G. at second base. Two out, and the batter is the man with the hot bat on this Met ball club, Cleon Jones. Number 21, Cleon Jones. Jones fouled out to first baseman Powell in the first inning. In the history of the New York Mets, Nobody has ever carried a higher batting average than this young man. The highest average before Jones's 340 this year was held by Richie Ashburn. And that was in the Mets' very first season, 1962. Two on, two gone. McNally's struggling now with both the fastball and also that slider he threw too low and tight. That's A.G. at second base. Plus Harrelson at first base. With a good lead, he's not being held by Powell. Top of the third, no score. 1-0 to Jones. 2-0. and oh. McNally now has failed to find the plate in six straight pitches. After McNally picked up those 15 straight wins this season, uh, on which Kurt commented, he had struggle situations with his control during the month of August. Two balls and one strike. He kept the fastball a little bit outside on the corner to Jones. A.G. at second, and there's Harrelson, the runner at first. Jones, two balls and one strike. Three and one. McNally now is really treading on thin ice here in the top of the third. At the moment, there is no activity in the Oriole bullpen, but there is some stirring going on out there. This fellow's moving around. Now, the Orioles have long relievers like Dave Leonard. Three and one. Three and two. Normally, long relievers are Leonard and Harden. And let's see, this is Harden, Jim Harden. And that's the bullpen coach right beside Harden, uh, watching him warm up. That was Charlie Lau. This is McNally. Knows he's in a tough spot. Knows he's got to concentrate. Knows he can't give Jones too good a pitch on three and two. Jones has power and a good clutch swing. Jones can hit the ball up the middle and also to the power pocket. 
Runners go. Deep left field. Buford giving it a chase. And Buford almost lost that deep fly ball. He looked like he might have almost overrun the ball. That ball was really ripped to left field. Don Buford converted into an outfielder from an infielder. He's short. He has to go up for this one. Another foot or two, and the Mets might have had two runs in. And so, at the middle of the third inning, the score is New York nothing, Baltimore nothing. Well, we've only had one base hit in the ball game thus far as we go to the bottom of the third, and that was by Al Weiss to start at the top of the third. Beginning the bottom third, here is Mark Belanger, the eighth batter, and the Orioles shortstop. Right center field with A.G. And A.G. with a good speed backed up one step in front of the warning track. Now, unlike yesterday, with the exception of Buford's uh, first inning home run, we've had a lot of long, hot shots in this ballpark within three innings. Dave McNally, who likes Hoosman, although he throws left, that's right. And who, like all pitchers, uh, loves to brag once in a while about a home run, such as he hit this season. Ball one to McNally. On deck is the leadoff batter, Don Buford. One ball and one strike. Kuzman's fastball uh, moving quite a bit, actually. Uh, some people feel that Kuzman's fastball moves even more than Seavers does. He let up on the breaking ball. Two balls and one strike. McNally never played uh, high school baseball, but did play on the fine program out in Billings, Montana, provided by the American Legion. Two and two to McNally. Kuzman has been moving the ball around, especially working the inside corner to McNally and everything down to his knees. Kuzman hangs up his third strikeout and his second out in the bottom of the third. In the first nine batters, the Orioles have had only one Number base nine. runner. That was Donovan. Johnson with a two-out ball at last inning. Here's Buford, one of the hitting heroes yesterday and provided them with great strength as a leadoff batter all season long. Two out, no score. Oh, what a magnificent play by, uh, by Harrelson. Magnificent. Well, we see two brilliant plays by these shortstops, Belanger, and now Harrelson comes up with one. Watch his dive for this one. A sensational stab here by Harrelson. Cut that ball about six inches off the ground, held onto it, even though his impact could have jarred it loose. And so at the end of the third inning, the score is New York nothing, Baltimore nothing. Don Clendenin. In the top of the fourth inning, it will be Don Clendenin, followed by Ron Svoboda and Ed Charles. Clendenin a lot would go after the first pitch, but had no chance to go after that one. Clendenin is known as the first ball swinger. Clendenin walked in the second inning. One ball and one strike. One after the fastball, Frank Robinson's got a tough play to the fence in right field, and the Mets have gone ahead one to nothing. That's almost in the same spot where Buford hit his home run yesterday for the Orioles. Glenn Denning with opposite field power, just cleared the fence in the right field in front of the auxiliary scoreboard. Glenn Denning really been hitting in this series yesterday and today. He's now been on base twice today. He had two hits yesterday. 
Look at that follow through. McNally serving ball one to Ron Sabot. Kuzman has held the Orioles hitless. Well, the Mets have picked up two hits off McNally, including that uh, blast by Clendon. Off his uh, feet, right in the batter's box, and a foul ball. McNally has just had a personal 14 inning scoreless streak snapped. And snapped indeed by Clendenin. And incidentally, uh, Dave McNally also had 12 scoreless innings uh, during World Series competition snap. One ball, two strikes to Svoboda. On deck is Ed Charles. One and two. Two balls and two strikes. When Svoboda was a Met rookie in 1965, he had 19 home runs, more than any other rookie in the history of the amazing men. Just trying to relax as he's swinging the shoulders around. Two and two. Still riding two and two. So far in this game, Bill, the Mets have hit the harder shots off McNally than the Orioles have off Kuzman. They've hit the ball hard three or four times right at somebody for outs, but they've stung the ball. Two and two again. McNally has his third strikeout and his first out in the top of the fourth inning. Well, Tony getting ready to talk to the very attractive Mitzi Gaynor, and I'm sure Tony's Number looking five, forward to that. Ed Charles. Ed Charles is the batter. Remember now, immediately following this game, stay tuned for American Football League action where you will see the New York Jets at Cincinnati, Houston at Kansas City, and Oakland at Denver. Pretty tight to Charles for ball one. The fastball, the has got to make a hurried throw, and he got him by one stride. That was a chopper. And Belanger had no trouble bringing it down, but realizing that Charles has a pretty hot seat and speed down the first base Number side, had a hurry of throw. Jerry Grody has been up once today, fly to center field. The Mets are leading one to nothing, batting on the top of the fourth on Clendenin's leadoff opposite field home run. The curve for a strike. McNally, a 22-game winner last year, a 20-game winner this year. Okay to Etcher Baron. One ball, one strike. Gil Hodges in the uh, Mets dugout along with Rube Walker, his, uh, his pitching coach. Well, that bird uh, enjoying the World Series, and he's the only one to come in this uh, in this ballpark without a ticket today. One one. Robinson tough again and made it. Well, it's an odd thing. Brooks Robinson says this is not the hardest play for him. Usually it is for a third baseman. The secret, he says, is to pick the ball up as his left foot. I watch him and throw off the right foot. There he is picking it up on the left foot as it strikes and then throwing as he lifts his right foot up. And he throws overhand. He says his toughest play is backhanding across the body to the line. And so in the middle of the fourth inning, it's New York one, Baltimore nothing. So for a one nothing game, Where? we've had four brilliant plays here and a lot of action. We've had one by uh, Harrelson, one by Brooks Robinson, one by Belanger. This is Paul Blair on the bottom of the fourth inning. Yanked the head out on that low breaking set from Kuzman. He 
He got the fastball through to the belt and he kept it right on the inside corner. So Kuzman has gone soft curve and also gone with heat to the inside corner. And he's way in front of Blair at two strikes. Frank Robinson is on deck. This should be played by Harrelson or Weiss. It is Weiss waving off AG. Let's pause briefly for station identification. This is... Number 20, Frank Robinson. Frank Robinson now, the Baltimore batter in the bottom of the fourth inning. He slides deep to right center to the 390-foot marker in the first inning. But Svoboda ranged far and deep to pull down the deep fly ball. Robinson is hitless in the series. The Mets pitchers have handled him five times. Ball one. One away on the bottom of the fourth. Tough play for Harrelson, but he had the good range. Right back at second base. Another good range defensive play by Harrelson. Two away on the bottom of the fourth inning. Harrelson, uh, before that ground ball off Robinson sat, had shaded the hole of this. He was not blocking the hole, but was shading it. Powell fanned against uh, Kuzman in the second inning. Now twice when Powell was up in the second inning, and let's see if Kuzman does it again, Kuzman came with good hard stuff from the first base side. Crossfire fastball. He came from the three-quarter side that time. Ball one. Brooks Robinson on deck with two out. Mets are leading one to nothing. Orioles batting in the bottom of the fourth. Now Weiss on the hot shot. One hopper to retire the side at the end of four innings to play. It's New York one. Baltimore nothing. Thank you, Bill. I've got Mitzi Gaynor down here. Mitzi, how are you enjoying the ball game? It's marvelous. Of course, the World Series is about the most exciting event of all sports uh, of the year. You know, you're going to have a chance tomorrow to uh, show some people all over the country a special. Mitzi Gaynor special. Is it a good show? Oh, I, I, well, we think it's a good show. You're being too I'm modest. On right now. I hope everybody enjoys it. It's on Who, show. Who's going to be on the show with you? Ross Martin is, uh, is uh, on the show with me, and he's one of the co-stars of... Uh, the Wild Wild West show, and he's a brilliant man. I, I just, I couldn't be more excited about him, and it's, he does a wonderful, wonderful job in the show. Mitzi Gaynor, what time is this going to be, and it's tomorrow night, isn't it? It's tomorrow night, yes. It's uh, October the 13th, and it's on 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time and 9 o'clock Central Time. Mitzi Gaynor, thank you so much. You've added a lot to the ball game, especially for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Two strikes Let's to Let's go on Al back White. upstairs. Two strikes to Al Weiss, and it stays there on the riding foul ball back to the screen. Weiss had a base hit to begin the top of the third. A looking third strike, and McNally has now hung up four strikeouts. McNally, uh, during the regular season, in more than 230 innings of work, fanned 166 American League batters. And the applause from, uh, naturally, a partisan Baltimore crowd, but a very good round of applause, is for this strong New York Mets pitcher, Jerry Kuzman. Kuzman has faced 13 men and retired 12 of the 13. Kuzman fans in the third. Got a piece of the McNally fastball. The Mets are leading one to nothing on the strength of the powerful home run wallet by Clem Dennis. One strike. One ball, one strike. It looked like Kuzman had an early notion and then uh, figured out that that breaking stuff was too low and inside. One and one to Kuzman. We've had uh, this ball game featured by Clendon and Thorner and some outstanding defensive plays both sides. One, one. One ball and two strikes. Kuzman, uh, when he was pitching against McNally, uh, kept his stuff low and tight, 
And McNally working over his opposing pitcher the same way. Two strikeouts in the inning. Five strikeouts for McNally. The second time that he's fanned Kuzman. Now McNally will go against the top of the Mets order. Tommy A.G. A.G. Uh, was robbed perhaps of a base hit back in the third inning. When he uh, grounded a hot smash to the hole at short and Belanger turned it over into a fourth play at second base. A.G. trying to pick up right now his first base hit in the series. Checked his swing but not in time. The Corey, the National League umpire, claiming that he committed himself and snapped the wrist. One ball and one strike. A.G. played the most games of any member of the Mets, scored the most runs, Bell did the most homers and had the most RBI. Off is the shoes in the batter's box and fell. A.G. and uh, Cleon Jones had uh, quite a battle for the RBI leadership. A.G. wound up with 76. Jones had 75. Two away. The Mets are leading. They're batting in the top of the fifth inning. McNally uh, off and on has had uh, control difficulties, especially during the third inning, but he survived the third inning without a run score. Fastball is strike three looking. He got it right to his letters. McNally stay on the side. And so at the middle of the fifth inning, the score is New York one, Baltimore nothing. Tony Kubek has another guest downstairs, and Tony, whom do you have? Thank you, Bill. Down here with me is Sandy Koufax, and I think, uh, Sandy, we're seeing quite a pitching game. Uh, yes, we are, Tony. Uh, I think they're both capable of that. Uh, Mickey and I talked about it on the pregame show. They're both great pitchers. I said Kuzman was going to have to do a better job. He couldn't do an equal job because I felt that Baltimore had a better ball club, and so far he has. You can't fault anything Jerry's done. He's done a great job. Sandy, uh, Early in the ball game, Frank Robinson hit a ball in right field. It looked like it was going to go out, and the wind seemed to hold it up. Well, I think the wind is blowing in a little bit from right to date. If you hit the ball high, it's going to keep it. It's not going to get out. Uh, the ball from then and hit with a line drive. Brooks Robinson grounding out from third to first is Charles to Clem Dennis. And now let's turn over this NBC microphone to Kurt Gowdy. Thank you, Bill. Robinson had previously flied the center. Dave Johnson up now. Walked his first time. The only man to reach base with the Orioles has been Dave Johnson. Guzman has struck out three. Walked one. One to nothing. New York on Don Clendenin's home run. A ball. Curves over. Been a big pitch for him today. One ball, one strike. Dave Johnson had leg injuries all year that hampered him. Change up. One ball, two strikes. On deck, Andy Echebarra and the catcher. Johnson also has some back trouble. Jerry Kuzman. Delivers one and two. Two and two now. Kuzman is from Morse, M-O-R-S-C, Morse, Minnesota, town of about 4,100. And they have a delegation here today. They're supposed to have a big sign somewhere down the right field foul line. The 2-2 two -two delivery. Curve is three and two. This is the second three and two count that Kuzman's had in the game. Both on Dave Johnson. That's how sharp he's been with his control. One out, nobody on, the 3-2 pitch. Fly ball, right field. Ron Sloboda puts it away, and they're two down. 
When that ball leaves the bat, these outfielders have been flipping those sunglasses down today. What the ball players call a light sky. There's not a cloud in the sky. And that makes it a tough sky when you're looking up there in that bright sun. Right. Andy, Andy Etcheburn. Fly to center his first time. Play him over toward right. There are two down, nobody on. That slow ball of Guzman. One ball, no strike. Well, the Mets got lucky with this boy. He was pitching down in Fort Bliss, Texas. And a young fella down there recommended him to his uncle, who was an usher in Shea Stadium. Told the Mets to look him over. There's a fly ball into the right field corner. Deep. That ball is cut by Zavoda. That's twice he's been chased up against Spencer today. So it's three up, three down. And at the end of five innings here in Baltimore, the score, the New York Mets won, and Baltimore nothing. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBC Television Network. Bud Harrelson leading off. Bud Harrelson trying to punt, popped up to Andy Echeverry. One away for the Mets in the top of the six. Harrelson previously had bounced to the pitcher and walked. Leon Jones has fouled out the first and lined out the left field to end the third inning when there were two runners on. The Mets have two hits. White single in the third. Clendenin homered in the fourth. Baltimore's been held hitless and runless so far. Kurt, World Series crowds are always alive, but I think today's crowd is even more alive than yesterday. We had one of these uh, typical nail-biting types of ball games between uh, McNally and Tuesday. One out, nobody on. One and zero to Jones with Clendenin on deck. McNally has struck out six. There's Clendenin. Now it's two and nothing. He has walked two. Jones is a good breaking ball hitter. Pops it up. Shallow right center. Waiting for it is the center fielder, Paul Blair, who yelled second baseman Dave Johnson off. Kurt, uh, this is Linda Wareheim, uh, the only female member of the ground crew, and when they sweep off the bases, and also clean off the infield. Linda goes over and normally uh, she kisses the uh, third base coach. Every once in a while, every once in a while she'll take that broom and uh, she'll hit the third base coach right in the back. But she did the delightful thing, she kissed him. Ball one to Don Clendenin, who's walked and homered. Been on base four times now in these first two games. The third base coach was Eddie Yost with the Mets. Round ball to second. A big hop to Dave Johnson, and the Mets are quickly out one, two, three in the top of the sixth inning. At the end of five and a half innings to score, the New York Mets won, and the Baltimore Orioles nothing. Well, baseball capping off a record season with innovations this year, new divisional play, championship series playoffs, and it's all-time attendance record and culminated in the World Series here with Game 2 in Baltimore moving on to New York Tuesday afternoon at Shea Stadium, Gentry for the Mets, Palmer for the Orioles. And we'll be on the air on NBC at 12.30 Eastern Daylight Time 
next Tuesday afternoon. Mark Belanger, the last of the six innings, flying out his first time. And Kuzman dropped that curve in. He's had a fastball, a curve, and a changeup. Belanger finished strong. The fastball is wide to right. Laboda, one down. And let's see if Laboda now has had four put outs. And 11 in a row now have gone down. Since uh, Dave Johnson walked in the second, he's the only man to reach base so far for the Orioles. Dave McNally getting a run as he comes up. Kuzman, by the way, has delivered only 51 pitches in this game. Foul back. New York leading, one to nothing. Last of the sixth inning. Ball one strike one. The Orioles didn't hit much the last three weeks of the year. There's Don Buford on deck. They had two tight games against Minnesota in their championship series and scored 11 runs in the third game. The 1 1 pitch. Ball two. 2 and 1 to Dave McNally. Guzman, 25 years old. Blew the fastball by. Two and two. Right back to the box. And they're two down here in the last of the sixth inning. At the top of the order we go now, and Don Buford, who struck out swinging in the first, lined to short, robbed of a base hit in the third. By Bud Harrelson. You for the switch hitter. Number nine, Don Hibbert. Two down, nobody on. Buford trying to bunny's way on. Strike one to him. All Blair on deck. We talked about Tom Agee leading his club in RBI. Buford had 64 runs batted in this year. One and one to him. So we have two leadoff men in this uh, World Series. Both outstanding and driving in runs hitting in that leadoff spot. One one set. Change up. Bounce to short. Bad hop. Harrelson handles it. Throws him out. And for the first six innings of this game, Jerry Kuzman is fixed to no hitter. At the end of six, the score, the New York Mets won and the Baltimore Orioles nothing. Let's get down to Tony. Thank you, Kurt. Got Mickey Mantle down here, and Mick, it looks like Jerry Kuzman is throwing the ball right by these Orioles hitters. Well, he has real good stuff. Uh, I guess he's, he's got a no-hitter up until right now, and uh, from down here, he looks a lot better than he did. Uh, I was out in the truck, in the NBC truck, watching him a while ago, and he looked uh, he looks a lot better from here than he did out there. He's got a pretty good curveball, too. He has. He's got good stuff, and uh, he's not he's not giving him anything good to hit, and this is a tough ballpark to score in anyway, so it looks like it might be a long day for the Orioles. Mickey Mantle, thank you so much. Let's go back upstairs. All right, the Mets in the seventh. Lenart warming up. Dave Leonard warming up. That's the first warm-up action we've had. 
We need a bullpen today. Strike one to Sloboda. Fouled out and struck out. being played deep. A couple of strides toward left. A one strike. Though. One and one. Guzman sailing along and McNally now since Clinton and Homer has retired nine in a row. One ball, one strike. Last ball's inside, two and one. Nobody out. On deck, Ed Charles. Fly ball to deep right. Frank Robinson. Back by the wall. Boy, what plays we've had today. Kurt, uh, Frank had a little bit of trouble with the sun and with the high sky of which is close, but he had the ball in range all the way. And, of course, Frank knows how to play right field. He knew he had room going back against the fence and then just sang a little hard into the fence but kept the ball in the glove all the way. Ed Charles hit into a fourth play and grounded a short. 35-year-old infielder takes ball one. I'd like to read some of his poetry. They say it's good. One out, nobody on. Lashes it down the left field line. This may be for extra bases. Buford playing the carom off the wall. And in the second is Ed Charles with a double. Well, the Mets now have three hits. The Orioles, no hits. They catch the Mets, Dave Grody. Fly to center. Hit a slow roller that Brooks Robinson and made another one of his special plays on. Now he had retired, dead in a row. Now the Mets are threatening here in the top of the seventh. Check swing foul. Paul Blair out in center field playing all these hitters shallow. We'll get a shot of him here in a moment. The one strike pitch. Ball one strike one. There he is. He has confidence in his ability to go back. Kurt, there even have been times when Yastrzemski has been in this ballpark where Blair has played that shallow and then gone right to the fence to take away home runs from Yastrzemski, even playing that shallow. One ball, one strike. Brody hits the foul up in the seat. The Mets had a big delegation here that in the top of the seventh came up for the seventh inning stretch. And most of the Mets fans are in back of the Mets dugout for a space way. Dave McNally from the Big Sky Country, Montana. One ball, two strikes. A high fly in a shallow center. Belanger, the shortstop, calling for this one. And they're two down. Montana, not only the Big Sky Country, but 
some blue ribbon cross screens out there too. Al Weiss is single and struck out. Kirk, you do a lot of fishing. Uh, is that Snake River a good spot to fish? Have you ever fished there? I fish the Snake. It's very good. But they have uh, Rock Creek and the Yellowstone and the Jefferson and the Missouri. We're going to put uh, Weiss on. And they'll pitch to Jerry Kuzman. The Mets will have runners on first and second. This is the third walk by Dave McNally. The Mets are leading one to nothing here in the top of the seventh. I forgot the big hole, too. It's another great screen. Gary Kuzman getting a big hand for his brilliant pitching here today. Number 30 minutes. He's a lifetime 062 hitter. There's a home of Kuzman, the banner. Morse, Minnesota. His father is sitting out in that delegation. A delegation of 12. Kuzman has struck out twice. Ground ball to second. Johnson throw to Powell and the next one out in the top of the second. No run, one hit. There were no errors and two men left. At the end of six and a half, it's New York one and Baltimore nothing. Tony Kubek again. Thank you, Kurt. Down here with me, Joe Garagiola, one of the funniest people anywhere, not just in baseball. Joe, who's been firing the ball by everybody? I tell you, he makes the catcher look awful smart by the way he's pitching. He's changing speeds, and the toughest job for any catcher today is to remember what finger he puts down <laughs> because he's not going to make any mistakes. Uh, I think his ability to change speeds has made his fastball so effective, and he's just been a tremendous pitcher, obvious by the scoreboard. Joe, being based in New York, you've had a chance to see this Mets ball club all year long. They do have more than just pitching, don't they? No question about it. I think they've got good defense, and they don't make that many mistakes. They don't beat themselves. They make you lose to them. Plus, they've got a good tally of leading them, Gil Hodges. Gil Hodges, and I can't forget my man at first base, Yogi. He's the secret weapon. Speaking of Joe Gaggio, thank you so much. Right now, let's go on back upstairs. Joe will be on the Today Show Monday morning and through the week covering the World Series for NBC. Game three will be on Tuesday on NBC starting at 12.30 Eastern Daylight Time. Paul Blair, black and hard. Blair slide to left and popped up. World Series report starts at 12.30 with Sandy Koufax, Mickey Mantle, and Jimmy Simpson. Frank Robinson on deck and then Powell. Curve, there's the first base hit of the game. For the Baltimore Orioles. Kuzman loses his no-hitter. Now the big boys are coming up for the Orioles, Robinson and Powell. Gary Kuzman had set down 13 Orioles in a row since Johnson walked in the second. Paul Blair, good base runner, first base. He stole 20 bases out of 26 attempts back this last year. They're deep and straight away for Robinson. Foul ball back. He nearly put one out in the first with a long drive to right center. That forced Swoboda up against the fence. And he grounded out in the fourth to short. He's smart at that plate. He likes to guess with that pitcher. Wait for his pitch. That's why he has so many check swings. One strike to him. He does. The only man to ever hit a ball out of this ballpark, completely out of it, is at the plate right now, Frank Robinson. 66 season. Ball two. He hit one over the left field grandstand. Just, you see that sign right up right up on that pennant, right over that back wall. What a terrific shot that was. The only man to ever do it in this ballpark. There's a line drive to center. Tom Agee's there for it. One away. 
Paul Blair shooting back to first. The New York Mets are leading one to nothing. In the last half of seven, and Blue Powell coming up and struck out and grounded out. For a fellow that has such a big swing and hits with such power, he makes contact. It's 304 for the season. The Orioles are warming up Tom Phoebus in their bullpen. Powell got a big hit for the Orioles this year in the ninth inning of the opening game against Minnesota in the playoffs. He had a leadoff homer to tie the game. The curve, fly ball down the right field line is foul. He didn't have a good swing on that. He was fooled. in the year Powell was lunging a lot on the baselines he got into a collision with Tommy Fresh hurt his hip cut down in his swing and helped his batting average the one strike pitch outside to him one and one on deck is Brooks Robinson All Blair at first, one out. Mets are leading, one to nothing. Again, a sidearm breaking pitch at him, fool. Fouls are back at one and two. Susman's coming in there, sidearm to him. One ball, two strikes. Pops it up. Bud Harrelson, the Mets shortstop, waiting for it. Squeezes it out, number two. And here's Brooks Robinson. Now, so far, the Mets pitchers are taking care of Robinson and Powell in this series. Brooks Robinson, 0 for 2. Kuzman finished strong for the Mets this year. He had a five-game winning streak at the end of the season. He was uh, knocked out in Atlanta in game two in their championship series. But he's bounced back today with a brilliant effort. The curve is a strike. Fastball, third, change up, mixing them up. failed to hit yesterday. He's 0 for 6 so far after getting 7 for 14 against Minnesota. You know, he knocked in 84 runs during the year when you consider hitting behind Powell and Robinson who cleaned the bases a lot. It's quite an RBI total. There goes the runner. The throw by Grody. with a pretty good jump on Kuzman. Uh, Blair had 20 steals just in under the tag and in time. Now the Orioles have the time run at second, two down. A 1-1 pitch to Brooks Robinson. They hey, This is going to be a tie game. Going in the score for Blair. Curve and Robinson gets back to first. 
No action right now in the net bullpen. One run, three hits for the Mets. One run, two hits for the Orioles. Curve again is the ball. One and one. Infield in the day and a part of both ball clubs. Here comes now the fourth brilliant play we've had by infielders. Charles got his glove down just in time. He had the glove down, the ball right in the glove, then he had to straighten up and make the strong throw over to first base. Over to second base, rather, for the fourth play. Well, the score at the end of seven innings is tied. New York won and Baltimore won. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBC Television Network. Top of the eighth inning, Tom Agee's up with a count two and one. Hit hard to short. Mark Belangio with a good foul and one out. Dick Hall, a right-hander warming up. Right after today's World Series game, stay tuned for American Football League action. You'll see one of the following games, either the New York Jets at Cincinnati, Houston at Kansas City, or Oakland at Denver. Bud Harrelson bounced to the pitcher, walked and fouled to the catcher. 0 for 2. Foul ball down the third baseline. Pitching and defense have sparkled today on both clubs. On deck is Cleon Jones. One ball, one strike. One out, nobody on. Look Robinson to his left. He's got him. He's down. The human vacuum. Kurt Belanger was in position to get the ground ball, but Brooks cut right in front of Belanger. He had the glove down just like Charles did, and then he had a hurry of throw to first base to just get the runner by two steps. You can see why Brooks Robinson says, I go all right to my left. I have a little trouble to my right. <laughs> Leon Jones fouled out, lined out to left field in the third, flied out to center in the sixth. Kurt, the one fundamental that Brooks Robinson talks about to youngsters during special baseball clinics, the first thing he mentions is when the ball comes off the bat, he tells youngsters, get the glove down, get the glove down. Now with two down and nobody on, Robinson plays over and guards the third base line. The third strike to Jones. Has to keep a ground ball or a line drive from going down there for extra bases with two away. He's won the Golden Glove Award nine years in a row for the top fielding third baseman in the nation. American League. One ball, one strike. Score tied, one to one in the top of the eighth. Two to Cleon Jones, two and one. There's Don Flynn Denon on deck. Curve strike two. The Orioles have the bottom of the order coming up in the last of the eighth. Etcheveron, Belanger, and McNally. 
Dick Hall's warming up in the Oriole bullpen, which means we may have a pinch hitter for McNally. We'll wait and see what happens. The 2 2 pitch to Cleon Jones. Foul. This boy wound up as the third leading batter in the National League. The year before, he ranked sixth in batting. Looks like he'll be up there in that top ten for years to come. The 2 2 pitch, foul off. down nobody on two and two to Cleon Jones fly ball to deep right Frank Robinson drawing a beat on it and the Mets are out one two three in the top of the eighth inning at the end of seven and a half the game is tied one to one Cincinnati birthplace of professional baseball was also the site of the first World Series game. Chester Allen Arthur was president of the country when on October 6, 1882, the Chicago Colts National League Bank clashed in an unauthorized series with the Cincinnati Red Sox. Way back to 1882. And of course, this is baseball's centennial year. Andy Echebarren is fly to center and fly to right. Ball one. On deck is Mark Belanger. Then the pitcher, Dave McNally. Line drive. One away. Al Weiss making the play. We've had a lot of balls hit hard, even Number though it's a one to one ball game. Mark Belanger fly to center and fly to right. Manager Earl Weaver says that Dave Johnson hitting number seven at a 280 average and this boy hitting 287 meant 15 games in the standings for the Orioles. A strike down at the bottom of the order. Yesterday, the bottom of the order helped the Orioles come up with that three run inning. One strike to Belanger. Curve is over, strike two. The league umpires work a little bit different than the American League umpires in their position behind the catcher. Two strikes. And now look, on a right-handed batter, Landers out. The National League umpires on the inside of the catcher. Left-hander on the other side. The American League umpire stands directly in front of the catcher. Dave McNally with two down, nobody on, will hit for himself. Gets a big ovation here from these fans in Baltimore. McNally has struck out and grounded out to the pitcher. They're playing him shallow and over toward right. to hit late. So he flies to deep left. Going back to Cleon Jones on the warning track for the out. McNally nearly reached the fence with that one. He fooled everyone. Three up and three down. At the end of eight innings, the game is still tied. New York one and Baltimore one. Together with Kirk Gowdy, this is Bill O'Donnell at Baltimore's Memorial Stadium. And a reminder that on Tuesday, the World Series moves to New York Shea Stadium, where the amazing Mets fans can fill the park to the tune of almost 2,200,000 paid admission this year. Welcome home, one of the great Cinderella teams in modern baseball. And that should be a great ball game. You'll see it all happen on NBC beginning at 12.30. 11.30 Central Time, Tuesday. Here's Kirk Young. Don Clendenin has walked, hit a home run to right in the fourth, grounded out in the sixth. Fouls it away. Frank Robinson's having some troubles with his left leg. I think he heard it bumping into the wall. 
on a catch earlier in the game, and they've been working on him in the Baltimore dugout. I think it's his left leg. He might have bruised it. Clendenin, Swoboda, and Charles for the Mets here in the top of the ninth. Strike two. Two strikes. McNally has struck out six, walked three, given up three hits. Kuzman's allowed only two hits. And on deck, Ron Sloboda. game of the week series through the summer here in the World Series is Alan Ross and our state manager Jim O'Gorman one ball two strikes to Don Clendenin Two, two, two. Nobody on, nobody out in the top of the ninth. The game is tied one to one. Swoboda has fouled out, struck out, and slide out. Number four, Ron Swoboda. Fairly good breeze has sprung up now and is blowing from first base towards third. There's the old factor here somewhere. One out, nobody on. Right on the letter. Frank Sikora firing in his fourth World Series. Fouls a curve off and the count is nothing and two. The Mets threaten in the seventh and McNally set him down in order in the eighth as the first man out here in the ninth. Is ahead on the count to Swoboda with Charles on deck. Ball one. This has to be one of the best defensive World Series games ever played. We just had one corking play after another one by both clubs. A one-two pitch. Ground ball. Boog Powell off the bag. McNally will cover. Two down. You know, Powell's an underrated first baseman, isn't he, uh, Bill? Most people, when they look at a big man, uh, Chris, they figure, you know, he doesn't cover too much ground, and he's slow. But Powell, although he's 245 to 250 pounds, has fine re reflexes, and he's very mobile for a big man, and he proved that mobility getting backhanded to that ground smash. Two down, Ed Charles up. Grounded into a fourth play. Grounded a short and double the left. And once again, Brooks Robinson moves over on top of that third baseline. The two down. And a tie game here in the ninth inning. It's a third strike to Charles. Charles does something. Jerry Grody would be up next. Looking ahead to the uh, Oriole ninth, they have the top of the order up. Buford, Blair, and Frank Robinson. The Mets are warming up. Tug McGraw in their bullpen.
Two strike pitch. Bounding ball in the left field. Charles has his second hit in a row. Buford throws in to Dave Johnson. Now the Mets have four hits. The Orioles two hits. And Jerry Grody the batter. Fly to center. Rolled out to third and popped to short. Charles at first, two away. Ball two. Six got away from him. They pause briefly for station identification. Kurt Gowdy and Bill O'Donnell back here in Memorial Stadium, Baltimore. Two down, game tied one to one, top of the ninth, and Tony Kubek in the stands. The 2 1 pitch. Foul down the first baseline. Notice those insignias on top of the visitors' dugout representing each club of the American League. Two and two to Jerry Grody. There goes Charles. There's a base hit to left. Charles is coming around the third. The throw goes in the second. And the Mets have runners on first and third. So after two out, nobody on. Successfully singles by Charles and Grote. They had Charles running on the pitch, and he got over to third. And now George Bamberger, the Oriole pitching coach, is going to the mound. There's nobody warming up right now in the Oriole bullpen. He may just be coming out to talk to McNally. If you bring a right-hander on to Weiss, the Mets would undoubtedly shift to their left-handed hitters. And uh, the left-handed hitters who haven't played in the first two games of the series were red hot against Atlanta. Kurt, although these two clubs are playing each other uh, for the first time, uh, both clubs have personnel uh, that have told their managers and the rest of their ball players about the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the opposition. For example, uh, Tommy A.G. and Al Weiss of the Mets have both played in the American League and both played for the White Sox, and they know quite a bit about uh, the Orioles. And uh, one of the, two of the members of the Orioles, uh, a relief pitcher, Dick Hall, and also a utility catcher, Clay Dalrymple, both played with the Phillies, so they know quite a bit about the Mets. After Bamberger went back to the Orioles dugout, the sign went out to the Orioles for warm-up action. It's Dick Hall warming up again now. There's a base hit to left coming in to score Charles, and the Mets take the lead two to one. Three hits in a row for the Mets. Al Weiss coming through with a big hit here with two down in the top of the ninth. And Gary Kuzman's up now. Kuzman has struck out twice and grounded out. Gary Grody stops at second. Runners on first and second, two down. The Mets now have two runs, six hits. The Orioles, one run, two hits.
Nothing and one to Kuzman. That's the lead runner, Grody at second. There's Al Weiss at first. He's been on base three times today. A 215 hitter. Has driven in the lead run. Heading in the number eight spot. That's the Baron Block. It's one ball, one strike. Weiss drove in the only run for the Mets yesterday. One ball, one strike. To Jerry Kuzman is going to come out and face the top of the Baltimore batting order in the last of the ninth inning. Buford, Blair, and Frank Robinson. Foul back. One ball, two strikes. On deck, Tom A.G. at the top of the order. Two. Well, the bottom of the order has done it for the Mets here in the top of the ninth. The 2 2 pitch. Slow roller. Belanger charging. Throws him out. But the Mets had one run. Three hits in a row. There were no errors and two left. We're going to the last of the ninth inning with a score. New York two and Baltimore one. Gary Kuzman just walking to the mound, getting a hand from some of the fans. And let's quickly go down to Tony Quebec. Thank you, Kurt. With me once again, Mickey Mantle. Mickey, I have not seen very many World Series games where there were more great defensive plays made. Well, I haven't either, Tony. I think that... Uh, Brooks Robinson made some of the best plays I've ever seen. Them plays where he comes running in along the infield there and grabs that ball and throws it on a dead run like that. Is, I've seen him play a long time, but he still amazes me every time I see him. Nick, you know what Al Weiss just did a moment ago in getting that clutch base hit has been typical of this Mets ball club all year long. It's always somebody different. I know. It just seems like uh, whenever they have to have a hit like that, they get one. Uh, it's going to be tough for the Royals to score. It looked like the wind was changing for a while. But it's still they've blown in from right field. If they're going to hit one, they have to hit it over the left field fence. Mac, thank you so much. Right now, let's go on back upstairs. Don Buford leads off for the Baltimore Orioles in the last of the ninth. He has struck out, lined to short, and grounded out. He'll be followed by Blair and Frank Robinson. Gary Kuzman had a no-hitter for six innings. The first hit off him was by Blair in the seventh. Brooks Robinson singled Blair in, and those have been the only two hits in the game. For the Orioles, here's the pitch. Ball one, the Buford. Foul back. Right in here in our NBC telecasting booth for another souvenir. The Mets have an active bullpen. Chuck McGraw, left-hander. Taylor, a right-hander, warming up. 1-1 one, one pitch. Pop up in the right center. Swoboda calling for it. And there's one out. Voters had five putouts today in right field. Well, so far, the Orioles have, have had their fewest hits in any game this season. Twice they were held to three hits Ball during the year. Blair. They've had only two hits today. Ball Blair, flag to left, popped up and single. The Orioles have had an incredible home record this year. They won 63 and lost only 21 here all year. Guzman's curve hangs outside for him. Ball one. 
He's had a live fastball today. A good curve, and then he's changed up. Mixed them up. Sharp control. Ball two, two or nothing. He's walked only one man. On deck, Frank Robinson. That was Dave Johnson in the second. Foul back. Mets are leading two to one, last to the ninth. Outside of that one walk, Kuzman's had only two, three, and two counts in the game. Now he's three and one. The ball Blair. Frank Robinson to follow and then Boog Powell. Strike two. It's an interesting thing to look at the infield. Ed Charles is right on the third baseline, and so is Don Clendenin. They don't want anything to go down that line for extra bases. That's Charles. Look at him. Just a step off the third baseline. And Clendenin very close to the line at first. Ground ball to short. Bud Harrelson throw to Clendenin. Two down. The Orioles' last chance now is Frank Robinson. Fly to deep right center in the first, ground to short in the fourth, and fly to center in the seventh. Only 90 pitches have been thrown in this game by Jerry Kuzman. And now they're going to put four outfielders against Robinson. Al Weiss is going out to left field, the second baseman. In the left center goes Jones, A.G. goes to right center, and Slobota's in right field. Four outfielders are now defense. Bill Hodges did this against certain dangerous long ball hitters certain times during the season. So a special defense of four outfielders and three infielders now aligned against Frank Robinson. Trying to keep the ball from going in the gaps or in the corners. Gil Hodges sitting down. He hasn't made many mistakes this year. Ball one. But he did a great job managing over at Washington in the American League, too. Two down, nobody on. One ball, no strike. A strike on a fastball. One and one. something of Robinson flat out to the second baseman in deep left field. Strike two. One ball, two strikes to Frank Robinson. Kuzman throwing just as hard now as he did in the first inning. One ball, two strikes. Curve is a little bit low. Two and two. Robinson can hit the right field. Maybe try to go to that open right side of the infield. If he can. Two and two count. Fouled out of play. Mets are leading two to one. The Orioles have two down, nobody on, and a two-two count to Frank Robinson. Three and two. A three two pitch. We watch him. Frank 
Thomason, who has a bad leg, evidently. Rettman is coming in to run for Robinson at first. Al Weiss comes from left field back to second base. Merv Rettman now running at first. And Frank Robinson, who is hobbled, uh, evidently, with a bad left leg. You can see him whipping as he goes into the dugout. Rube Walker's got out to talk to Kuzman. Don Clendenin's there in the mound. And the dangerous boot piles up. Struck out, grounded out, popped up. Two hits and two walks. All that Kuzman is allowed today. He has struck out four. Ball one coming in with that crossfire delivery against the left-handed batter. Brooks Robinson on deck. Rettman at first, two down. Foul back. the foul. Trying to hold the Rettman close. Herb is ball two. Brody blocking it out in front of him as the catcher should do. Two balls and a strike. Doug McGraw, Ron Taylor still loosening up in the net ball fence. Charles wants to come over and talk to Kuzman. He's pitching fine, of course, to Frank Robinson and the Powell. You have to. Let's see what he gives him now on three and one with two down, Rettman at first. Two, two down. Rettman will be running on the pitch. There goes Rettman. Ball four. The two away. And the batter will be Brooks Robinson. Gil Hodges now, the manager of the Mets, is coming out. Speaking of comeback, what a comeback he made. We said hello to him on a World Series last year when he was in the hospital with a heart attack. And here he is now managing in a World Series a year later. where the managers earn their money right now with a decision. Leave him in or take him out. He's going to take him out and Ron Taylor. Ron Taylor is going to come in to pitch to Brooks Robinson. He should get a tremendous ovation, Kuzman. What a game he pitched here today. Kurt, uh, Kuzman came with him he was extremely strong uh, through the middle innings when he retired 13 in a row. There's a break in the action right here at Baltimore with a score in the bottom of the ninth inning. The Mets two and the Orioles one. Right after we sign off here this World Series game in Baltimore, you'll see one of the following games of American Football League action. Either the New York Jets at Cincinnati, Houston at Kansas City, or the Oakland Raiders against the Denver Broncos at Denver. Ron Taylor, who pitched yesterday two innings, allowing no hits, no runs of relief. 31 years old, born and lives in Toronto, Ontario. 
He won nine and lost four for the Mets this year. Had 13 saves and an earned run average of 2.72. Brooks Robinson came up with two down and Paul Blair on second in the seventh and singled him home. After two out, Kuzma walked Frank Robinson and Boo Powell. So the Mets are still trying to get this last out. It's always the hardest one. They nearly hit him. Ball one to Brooks Robinson. Harry Kuzman went eight and two-thirds innings, allowed only two hits, both those hits coming in the seventh. One run, he's responsible for the two men on. He walked three and he struck out four. Redman on second. Yesterday, Taylor struck out Brooks Robinson for the last out of the Orioles' eight. One ball, no strike. They play Robinson straight away. A check swing. Ball two. Started, held up. <laughs> he had looked he gave umpires the story. You have to say you call that one right. Two balls and no strength. Let him in a second. Luke Powell at first. Curve is in. Two and one. You may be saying to Taylor, you better get down a little bit, those pitches. It's been up high to Robinson. Two balls and a strike. Three and one. Doug McGraw still warming up in the net bullpen, a left-hander. Robinson swinging at an outside pitch. That looks like ball four for sure. Three and two now, two down. The runners will be going. Redmond at second. Powell at first. Okay, let's go. Three and two. We're going. There go the runners. There's a ground ball to Shaw. Makes the way to throw to first. He had ideas to go to third. He would have been late there. He went to first. Glenn Denham dug it out of the dirt, and the Mets win it two to one. Charles made a quick mental recovery on that one. What a ball game this was. In the ninth inning, Baltimore, no run, no hit, no errors. They left two. The final score, the New York Mets, two runs, six hits, and no errors. The Baltimore Orioles, one run. Coyotes don't make it. Roadrunners make it. Plymouth makes it. The 1970 Roadrunner, the car that's all go. You can get it with a 440 cubic inch engine, with three two-barreled carburetors, and you can get it with a driver-controlled air scoop up front. Three features the Baltimore Orioles versus the New York Mets from Shea Stadium in New York. World 
Series Baseball has been a CBC TV Sports color presentation in association with NBC Sports. This is the CBC Television Network. In 1969, man performed two feats that staggered the imagination of the American public. One took place in mid-July, 250,000 miles from planet Earth, when man first landed on the moon. The other took place in October, here on planet Earth on a baseball diamond, when the 101 underdog New York Mets became the world champions of baseball. How did the American public react to both events? They used one word. Amazing! 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 Asombrosos! Amazing! 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 It's just amazing! an exciting year for baseball. It marked professional baseball's 100th anniversary and the inauguration of the league championship series. And now the World Series, the New York Mets and the Baltimore Orioles. The Baltimore Orioles dominated the American League East and took three straight from the Minnesota Twins in the first American League championship series. Most experts rated the Birds as one of the strongest, best balanced ball clubs ever sent into a World Series by the American League. In hitting, fielding, pitching, power, speed, and experience, they have the likes of such proven stars as Frank Robinson, Boog Powell, Brooks Robinson, Dave Johnson, Mark Belanger, Don Buford, and Paul Blake. Baltimore was the logical favorite against the amazing New York Mets, whose dramatic performance in 1969 was the talk of the nation. From the depths of the second division, the champions of the National League East, to National League champs following a three-game sweep over the Atlanta Braves. Baltimore owner Jerry Hoffberger had a right to be confident, along with manager Earl Weaver and such American League greats as Ted Williams and league president Joe Cronin. It's a perfect day in Baltimore's Memorial Stadium. The cameras are poised, ready to bring to millions of fans the beginning of one of the truly remarkable World Series. Baltimore's ace left-hander, 24-game winner Mike Cuellar, handles the Mets easily in the top of the first. Mets manager Gil Hodges names 25-game winner Tom Seaver to start for New York. Don Buford, Baltimore's leadoff hitter, quickly jolts young Seaver with a home run. Here's that home run again. Watch Ron Swoboda. Did he go back fast enough or far enough? One to nothing Baltimore. Cuellar's speed and screwball handcuffed the all right-handed Mets batting order. Ron Swoboda is baffled by the screwball. Inning after inning, Cuellar shows his effectiveness. Cleon Jones, the Mets' leading hitter, has trouble getting a good piece of the ball. as does Don Clendenin, the Mets' leading slugger. In the bottom of the fourth, Seaver gets into trouble. Elrod Hendricks single. With two outs, the Orioles have a man on first. Dave Johnson walks, moving Hendricks to second.
Mark Belanger. Singles to right. Here comes Swoboda's throw. Hendricks scores. Johnson goes to third. Men on first and third, two out. The Orioles leading two to nothing. Pitcher Mike Cuellar at the plate. He bloops a base hit to left. Johnson scores easily. Belanger goes to second. Cuellar's on first. Three to nothing in favor of Baltimore as a harried Tom Seaver faces Don Buford. And now a belt in the right field. Caroms off the wall. Belanger scores easily. Buford has himself a double. Seaver finally gets the third out, but the Orioles wind up with a four to nothing lead. And there's happiness in Birdland. Seventh inning for the Mets, Clendenin batting. Mets still behind four to nothing. Clendenin singles for only the third hit of the game off Cuellar. Swoboda walks. Clendenin going to second. And for the first time in this 1969 World Series, the Mets have two men on base. After Ed Charles flies out, Jerry Grody's the batter. He rips one to left. Clendenin holds at third, and the bases are loaded for the Mets with only one out. Al Weiss at the plate. On the sacrifice fly, the left fielder Buford, Clendenin tags up and scores. And the Mets score their very first World Series run ever. In Baltimore, they call Brooks Robinson the human vacuum cleaner, and now you'll see why. Pinch hitter Rod Gasper tops a tough one to third. Robinson comes in, makes a sensational play for the third out. And this play proved to be the turning point of the game. In the top of the ninth, with the Mets trailing four to one, Swoboda's the batter. Cuellar can't find the handle, and Swoboda has a leadoff single. Cuellar gets the next two Mets, and then Al Weiss walks on four pitches to put runners on first and second. Coming up to pinch hit for the Mets is home run threat Art Shamsky, the potential tying run and the pressure now is on Cuellar. Shamsky grounds out, and the Baltimore Orioles win the opening game of the World Series 4-1. to one. Fans show up early for Game 2 of the 1969 World Series to watch infield practice and Brooks Robinson. Brooks Robinson, the man with a magic mitt and great hands. The American League's annual Golden Glove winner explains his game-saving play on Rod Gaspar. Well, I think the secret of the play is to keep in mind that you cannot look at the runner, and if the ball has stopped or is coming to a halt, always use your bare hand. And consequently, when I feel the ball with my bare hand, I always come up and throw overhand. Colorful pregame activities seem to brighten hopes for a New York Mets bounce back. Rooting for the Mets to get even, St. Louis manager Red Shandings, the great Stan the Man Musial, National League President Warren Giles, and the owner of the Mets, Mrs. Joan Payson. Starting pitchers are left-handers Dave McNally and Jerry Kuzman. Mrs. Babe Ruth, accompanied by Ted Williams, Commissioner Bowie Kuhn and Joe DiMaggio throws out the first ball. 20-game winner Dave McNally holds the Mets scoreless in the first three innings, aided by outstanding Oriole fielding. Here's that play again, slowed down. Tommy Agee seems to have a base hit, but Mark Belanger displays the skills which have made him one of baseball's outstanding shortstops. Not to be outdone, Jerry Kuzman gets some sparkling support, too. And it happens to come from his shortstop, Bud Harrelson.
In slow motion, it looks as though Harrelson doesn't have a chance. Top of the fourth, a scoreless tie. Don Clendenin batting for New York. Don tags it, and the Mets take the lead, one to nothing. That home run, incidentally, ends a streak of 23 scoreless innings compiled by McNally in postseason competition. McNally retires the next two Mets. Now Jerry Grody's up. Brooks Robinson charges in and duplicates the great play he made in the first game. The Birds have one of the best ground crews in baseball, or is it the best looking? 13-year-old Linda Wehrhein has a dusting routine midway through the game that completely charms the Mets third base coach, Eddie Yost. Linda almost has Eddie rooting for the Orioles. Almost. Going into the bottom of the seventh, tension in the stands mounts as Jerry Kuzman is working on a no-hitter. Can Kuzman join Don Larson as a World Series no-hit pitcher? There are only nine outs to go as Paul Blair leads off. And there it goes, a clean hit to the left side. The first one off Jerry Kuzman in the second game of the World Series. Two outs later, Blair is still on first. On the second pitch to Brooks Robinson, Blair gets a big jump and heads for second. And he has it. Brooks Robinson, a great clutch hitter, steps up and drives the next pitch through the middle. Blair scores from second, and the Orioles tie it up at one off. With Brooks Robinson at first, Ed Charles comes up with an outstanding play to end the inning. Even in slow motion, that ball looks like it's hit like a bullet. But Charles snares it on the bounce. In the Mets' top of the ninth with two down and the score still tied at one to one, Ed Charles shows he can do things with his bat, too. The Mets finally hit a ball past Brooks Robinson and now have the possible go-ahead run on first base. With a count two and two and Jerry Grody batting, Gil Hodges puts on the hit and run. Grody finds the same hole and Charles wheels all the way to third on the single to left. McNally now faces Al Weiss, one of the Mets' modest heroes. Base hit. Ed Charles comes home, and the Mets are back in front, two to one. Kuzman ends the Mets ninth as he bounces out. The Langer to Powell. McNally, who's pitched a fine game, needs runs as the Mets lead two to one. With two out in the last of the ninth and Frank Robinson coming up, manager Gil Hodges sends second baseman Al Weiss to the outfield. The Mets now have four outfielders. Gil explains his strategy. We played four outfielders uh, with Frank Robinson at bat, mainly to cut down the chances of getting an extra base hit. If we can keep Frank Robinson on first base, why we have a much better chance of winning. Kuzman walks Robinson. Frank seems to limp a little from a sore left foot. Kuzman now has to face Big Boog Powell, the Baltimore cleanup batter. Powell walks. The tying run goes to second. Powell's on first. And the always dangerous Brooks Robinson coming up. Out of the dugout comes manager Hodges to replace Kuzman. The young left-hander expresses his feelings at this moment. I was a little depressed not being able to finish the ball game, but after I heard all the applause, it kind of left my mind, and I was real thankful just to be able to play in a World Series. As Ron Taylor comes in to relieve, the situation is ticklish for the Mets. Brooks Robinson's the batter. Powell's on first, and pinch runner Marv Rettenmund is on second. On the 3-2 pitch, both runners are going. A ground ball to third. 
Ed Charles makes a split-second decision, throws to first. Out! The game is over. The Mets win it 2-1, to one, their first World Series victory. And the series is now tied at one game apiece. A happy airline hostess greets the victorious Mets as they board their charter flight for New York City, where the next three games will be played. It's wonderful to fly the friendly skies when that flight leads home. And home is beautiful Shea Stadium on the edge of Flushing Meadow Park. Big Shea, where the amazing Met fans pour in by the thousands. Starting pitchers for game three are rookie Gary Gentry and Jim Palmer. Celebrities seem to be everywhere. But of course, the real celebrities of Shea Stadium are the amazing fans with their ubiquitous banners. The spirit of the Met fans seems to stimulate the Met players. They believe they're fans and vice versa. Tommy Agee, first man up for the home team, reacts to the fans' enthusiasm with this tremendous shot. Home run to center. Score, one to nothing, New York. Second inning for the Mets, Jerry Grody walks with two outs. Switch hitter Bud Harrelson bats left-handed against the right-handed Palmer. Harrelson singles to center. Grody stops at second. Gary Gentry is the batter. The weak-hitting rookie pitcher surprises center fielder Paul Blair. It's over his head for a double, scoring Grody and Harrelson. Three to nothing, Mets. In the fourth inning, Gentry pitches to Frank Robinson. It's a sinking liner to left. Cleon Jones dies for it. Did he get it? Let's look again. No, on the first bounce, says umpire Hank Soar. With Robinson on first, Boog Powell's up. Powell bounces a hit to right. Robinson goes to third. With men on first and third and two outs, Gentry faces Elrod Hendricks. The scene is now set for one of the great catches in World Series history. Hendricks belts it to deep left center. A.G. races for it. What a play. Let's watch that amazing catch again in slow motion as Tom A.G. robs the Baltimore Orioles of two big runs. Sixth inning now, the Mets' Ken Boswell at bat with a score still 3 to nothing, favor of the Mets. It's a ground ball wide of first. Dave Johnson makes a fine play. Pitcher Palmer covers but misses the bag, and Boswell is safe. Ed Cranepool's slow bouncer moves Boswell to second. Jerry Grody up. And he promptly doubles down the left field line. Boswell trots in with another run, making the score four to nothing in favor of the Mets. And the Mets fans let loose. The Royals top of the seventh. There are two men down when Gentry walks himself into a jam. He starts it by walking Mark Belanger. Baltimore's Dave May. Pinch hitting for pitcher Jim Palmer, also walks. Belanger goes to second. There's a breeze blowing through Shea Stadium as Gentry faces Don Buford. Buford also walks to load the bases. And suddenly, the Mets have a crisis. Gentry can't get that third out. 
Manager Gil Hodges does some walking of his own out to the mound. Hodges now makes a daring decision. He's taking the rookie out after he pitched three hit ball for six and two thirds innings. And Jeffrey gets an ovation as he comes to the Mets dugout. Manager Hodges and the Mets pin their hopes on young Nolan Ryan, the fireballing strikeout artist. There's no place to put the next batter, Paul Blair. The bases are loaded, two outs. Strike one. Strike two. And get ready now for a play that will be talked about for years. Blair connects, and Tommy Agee does it again. Another miracle catch. There have been other great fielding plays in World Series history, but never before has one man made two such dramatic and crucial catches in one game. Agee alone has cost Baltimore at least five runs. Thrill to it again in slow motion. Agee's diving, skidding, one-handed catch with the bases loaded once again saves the Mets. In the Mets' eighth, Ed Cranepool, the only Met who's been with them since their first year, hits his first series homer, making the score five to nothing in favor of the National League champion. And that smile tells it all. From the cellar to the World Series. That's right. Fantastic. Top of the ninth now, with the Mets still ahead five to nothing and two outs. Mark Belanger walks. The next batter is Clay Dalrymple, pinch hitting for the pitcher. Al Weiss makes a beautiful stop. But Belanger beats the play. The next batter, Don Buford, walks to load the bases. Once again, the Mets are in trouble. They're only one out away from winning game three, but Baltimore has the bases loaded. Manager Hodges talks it over with his battery and decides to let Ryan meet the challenge. The 22-year-old Texan proves his manager's faith is well-founded. He gets two strikes on the dangerous Paul Blair. One more to go. Strike three. The Mets win their second straight. Five to nothing. And now lead in the World Series, two games to one. Met fever is contagious. The entire country is fascinated by the unfolding drama of the underdog Mets more than holding their own against the powerful, highly touted Baltimore Orioles. The news media transmit a steady, rhythmic flow of glowing words and pictures to an anxious, dazzled world. The next day at Shea Stadium, everyone is still talking about Tommy Agee, including the greatest center fielder of all time, Joe DiMaggio. Well, I think they're both very fine catches. I would have to say they were comparable to the one that Willie Mays made in the 1954 World Series when the Giants were playing the Cleveland Indians. I think his first one in particular because at that time those runs were important and uh, to make the catch be I thought that the fence and he was quite conscious of the fact that he was so close to that fence that uh, he had to time that ball and when he did catch the ball he went into the fence. A.G. also talks about A.G. Well the second catch uh, was it in the right center field alley and I think this was an easier catch for me because it was on my glove side and I ran over I ran just about as far but the fact that it was on my left side made it a little bit easier. And the wind brought the, brought the ball back to the infield a little bit, the reason why I had to dive for it, I think. When I got to the ball, then I felt like I was going to catch it. But when I started after the ball, I didn't know whether I was going to catch it or not. In the fourth game, the two pitching aces, Mike Cuellar of Baltimore and Tom Seaver of the Mets, meet again. Fans start pouring into Shea Stadium. In the second inning, Cuellar faces Don Clendenin, a key man in the Mets pennant drive. Clendenin swings and rockets one into the Baltimore bullpen, and for the third straight game, the Mets lead one to nothing. This is Clendenin's second home run of the series, 
And before it's over, he's to hit another, setting a record for a five-game World Series. Don Clendenin. In the Orioles' third, it's Tom Seaver against Mark Belanger. Belanger singles to right, and the tying run is on base. With no outs in the pitcher up now, the Mets look for the bunt. Ed Charles creeps in from third, but Cuellar wears around, chops, and loops it over the infield for a base hit. The Orioles now have men on first and second with no one out. Don Buford's up again, and the Mets expect a bunt. But once again, the Orioles cross them up. Buford swings away, and Clendenin makes a beautiful play. With men on first and third, Paul Blair at bat tries to beat out a bunt. Seaver fields the ball and throws him out. Buford goes to second. Belanger holds third. Two outs, and Frank Robinson up. Robinson lifts a high pop foul. Clendenin waits, waits, and squeezes it to end the inning. Nancy Seaver cheers her favorite team and her favorite pitcher. The umpires now enter the drama. Manager Earl Weaver disputes a call strike from the Baltimore bench. Jag Crawford, the plate umpire, has a few things to say to Earl Weaver with gestures. When Weaver follows Crawford to the plate, reportedly to ask him, what did you say? He becomes the first manager to get thrown out of a World Series game in 34 years. Baseball rules stipulate an automatic ejection if a manager comes out of the dugout to question an umpire's judgment on balls and strikes. In the Orioles' fifth, Seaver's judgment calls for a curveball to Dave Johnson. Johnson loops it to short left field. Cleon Jones makes a beautiful sliding catch. Here it is again. Going into the ninth, the Orioles still trail one to nothing. Frank Robinson is up with one out. Robinson singles to left. Now the meat of the Birds batting order is coming up. Boog Powell steps in. Powell's grounder gets through for a base hit. Moving Frank Robinson to third. The Orioles now have runners on first and third with only one out. Up steps Brooks Robinson. You may not believe what you're about to see. It is probably the most incredible catch in World Series history. Watch the right fielder, Ron Swoboda. the man of the hour, Ron Swoboda. Brooks Robinson was up, and I tried to play him a little bit closer because I wanted to eliminate the possibility of any ball dropping in front of me that I could possibly throw the run out at home plate. What did happen was he hit a line drive to my right. I thought I got a good jump on him because I wanted the ball to be hit to me. That's an important thing for an outfitter. I wanted the ball. What happened afterwards, I guess, was as big a surprise to me as it was to anyone in the stands. Uh, I had a dive for the ball. And when I left the ground, I had no idea that it would hit my glove. It hit and stuck. I came up and tried to throw, but it was useless. The run scored. The Orioles tied the score when Frank Robinson tagged up after Sobota's circus catch. Seaver gets out of the inning when Hendricks flies to Sobota. The fourth game of the World Series goes into extra innings. Seaver squeaks through the Baltimore 10. And so it goes to the bottom of the 10th. The score tied at one all. Dick Hall is the Oriole pitcher. Jerry Grody leads off with a pop fly to right, a seemingly routine out, but Buford is fooled. 
It drops between him and Belanger for a double. Once again, the Met magic is at work. Rod Gasper is put in to run for Jerry Grody. Al Weiss is intentionally walked to set up a force play situation. When J.C. Martin is sent up to bat receiver, the Orioles change to a left-handed pitcher, Pete Riker. Martin drops a superb bunt to the right side. Riker's throw ricochets off Martin's wrist, and Gasper comes home with a winning run. The Mets win it 2-1 to one and lead three games to one. This game-ending play produced a delayed controversy. Was it interference? Even though stop action footage shows that J.C. Martin was in fair territory when hit, it was not ruled interference because, in the judgment of the home plate umpire, Martin did not intentionally interfere with the play. of New York City falls under the spell of the Mets. How did it happen? How did those lowly Mets reach this pinnacle? Fans everywhere are all in disbelief. They are all speechless. All that is, except for one. I believe the New York Mets are amazing, 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 amazing. They're just finding out now that it's just October and they found out now around the United States and all the patrons of New York City and Shea Stadium that they are amazing. They'll be amazing, amazing, amazing. And this year, I want you to follow them. They'll be known in all the periodicals because they'll be in South America. New Year's Day will be their best game. This year will get over in a hurry because the other clubs have to be strengthened more if they're going to do anything to surprise the amazing, amazing Mets. Joe DiMaggio, baseball's greatest living player, throws out the first ball for game five as the Mets shoot for baseball's world championship. It's a rematch between Dave McNally and Jerry Kuzman. In the top of the third, Mark Belanger leads off with a hit to right. Swoboda makes a surprise throw to first, where heads-up catcher Jerry Grody tries to win a shoving match. Pitcher Dave McNally up. The Mets are playing him to bunt. Some bunt. Into the Baltimore bullpen. The Orioles lead two to nothing. McNally's homer is the first extra base hit for Baltimore in 35 innings. And it proves contagious. With two out, Frank Robinson really bombs one over the left center field fence. And the Orioles now lead three to nothing in the top of the sixth it's still three to nothing as Kuzman again battles Frank Robinson it hits the bat says umpire Lou DeMuro it hit me first right here screams Frank Robinson it hit the bat after it hit me now in stop motion Kuzman's pitch it seems actually did hit Robinson and then bounced up to hit his bat you know, it's a lot tougher to call the play when you're standing behind the catcher and you don't have the benefit of stop-motion photography. Frank then looks at a third strike, which certainly doesn't help his feelings any. McNally now faces the Mets in the bottom of the sixth. The Birds leading 3-0. Cleon Jones is the leadoff batter. Lightning strikes twice. He too looks like he's hit by a pitch. But wait a minute. Is he or isn't he? Did he hit him? Yep. Oh, he hit him. How wonderful. Amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> Cleon has Don Clendenin carrying the argument for him. But the clincher comes when manager Gil Hodges brings out the evidence. See, a baseball with shoe polish on it from where the ball struck Cleon on the foot. The umpire admits the evidence is overwhelming and promptly awards Cleon Jones first base. The amazing Mets, it appears, even win their verbal battles. This naturally brings out Baltimore manager Earl Weaver with a few well-chosen words of his own. 
destiny seems set against him. He's having the same results with arguments as he is with games. He isn't winning any. Now with a man on first, McNally has to face Clendenin, the series' most potent slugger. Clendenin really belts one. A tremendous home run, his third of the series, setting a record for a five-game series. Two-run score, and the Baltimore lead is cut to three to two. The hard-hitting Clendenin is destined to be named the series' most valuable player. The Mets at bat in the seventh. Al Weiss, not known for power, drives McNally's second pitch over the left center field fence to tie the score at three all. Weiss has never hit a homer in Shea Stadium during the two seasons he's been with the Mets. But isn't that first time something? The crowd loves it. Last of the eighth. Score tied three all. Ed Watt now pitching for the Orioles. Cleon Jones, the first man up, really lays into one. And just misses a home run. He winds up with a double. One out later, Ron Swoboda comes to bat. Swoboda belts a liner to left. Buford makes a nice running trap, but it goes for a double, scoring Cleon Jones with a lead run. Four to three now in favor of the Mets. With two out, Jerry Grody's up. Grody hits a ground to the right side. Powell bobbles it, picks it up, tosses to the pitcher who covers late. Watt drops the ball as Swoboda roars home from second with a Mets fifth run. The city's at a standstill. Everywhere, fans are glued to radio and television sets as the Mets get ready for the top of the ninth, leading five to three, needing only three more outs for the world championship. Frank Robinson leads off with a walk. Boog Powell is next. Powell forces Frank Robinson at second. Al Weiss to Bud Harrelson. One down. Brooks Robinson at the plate. It's a high fly to right field. Swoboda... Has it. Two outs, one more to go. Dave Johnson at bat. Mets are number one, baseball champions of the world. The celebration goes on and on and on. The New York weather report, cloudy with falling confetti. Thus ends one of the great sports stories of all time. Call it what you will, Mets mystique, Mets magic, luck, destiny. For sure, it was superb, dramatic, thrilling, exciting baseball.
amazing, 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 amazing.